Yeah. Can everybody out there in Facebook land please give it up to Mara Hardy, the director of trade school live streams. And, and, and Whitney Luke, I'm not sure where Whitney is. She'll be back. She'll be back. The IT department for trade school. <laughs> um, all right, well, this is a discussion that I've been super, super excited about before the art was even finished. So as soon as you assembled this whole group, and, and we'll get there in a second, I, I've been looking forward to this conversation. So uh, welcome to trade school, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, we good? No? No? No sound? <laughs> now we're good? Oh. All right. <laughs> um, I'll start over then. Well, welcome to Trade School. Everybody, thanks for being here today. Um, this is the last panel uh, discussion of the day, and it's one we've been looking forward to. And, um, and, and it's day three, I guess. Uh, day three of trade school, day three of the outdoor retailer show. We're a block from the convention center where 30,000-ish men and women, leaders, brands, makers, manufacturers, journalists, advocates, policy makers around the outdoor world are here and, and making things happen. And, uh, it's great just to be down the block and bringing some of the conversations and excitement that the outdoor industry inspires uh, to uh, really a community that may not necessarily participate directly in the trade show. So thanks for being here. Uh, all week and, and all the sessions we've been exploring the nature of work and it's through this lens and filter of the outdoor inspired athlete, artist, advocate and entrepreneur and in, in thinking about this in advance of, of this week, we, we sort of wanted to, to I don't know, we, did, we sort of dug in on this, the, the nature of work a little bit, and we thought of, like, what are some things that, are, are, that, that we think of when we think of work? And we think of women, water, and the West. Um, and that overarching theme of women, water, and the West is what has really uh, informed all the discussions, all the panels, and also the artist collaboration. Um, I'm gonna you know, let the introductions happen here in just a minute, but just to set a little bit of context, um, one of the artists here, Andrew Slusarski, joined us for the winter edition, which was version 1.0 of trade school around the SIA, SIA uh, uh, winter OR show, and you know, we just began following our stuff at Drawing From Nature uh, on Instagram, and we started to see all our sketches and, and all her outdoor work, and, and we said, well, we've got to figure out a way to partner with Andrea on the summer trade school. And, and we reached out, and she actually called us back, which was really cool, and, and we said we got this idea, she got it. We did a partnership with John Fellows, Sarah Ewell, and Jack Ludlam for the, the winter trade school. And I shared with her the theme of Women Water in the West and like the words weren't even out of my mouth before she's like, okay, like if you'd be okay with it, I've got, I, I, like, I've, I've got a couple women that I, I love their work, I love their work. Would you be okay if I reached out? Could we, like, I'd like to work with them, I'd like to do some cool stuff with them. And she's like, well, here, let me show it to you. And we were like, Andrea, like, go. This is great. So um, I'm going to uh, also just uh, quickly share that in bringing their work to life, we just want to give a shout out to Harmonic Media and uh, the folks at the Public Works who you can talk a little bit more about, you know, how that all sort of transpired. But I just want to give those guys a shout out. And uh, here to moderate the conversation for us is, is uh, Mr. Brendan Leonard. You may know him from Semi Rad. Um, you should follow him. There's films, there's photos, there's podcasts, there's a weekly journal on Fridays that comes out that you'll laugh your ass off. It's fantastic. It's insightful. It's funny. It's great. So follow Semi Rad. Brendan, thanks for leading the conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chuck. Um, Thanks for coming, everybody. This should be fun. We should get into the deep shit very quickly here. This will be great. I love picking apart people's 
quote unquote creative processes, which I think you guys would probably all say there is none and it's way more messy than people think. Uh, and there is no actual routine. If you're not gonna say that, we should maybe not do this. Um, but yeah, like Chuck said, I do a lot of different things to avoid working a real job. Um, so I write a blog, I do um, Instagram drawings, I do film directing. Uh, I've, this is not my first panel that I've moderated. I've moderated several panels before, so that's, that's fun too. Um, but I'm excited for this one. Um, and I think I, I would like to have you guys actually introduce yourselves in whatever order you want, but kind of say who you are and how you introduce yourself, uh, or how you say what you do for a living to people, say, on an airplane, um, how that works. So whoever wants to go first. Okay. Um, I'm Kat Carney. Uh, I guess on an, if I were on an airplane, I would say to people, I'm an outdoor photographer, and I shoot... Uh, mountaineering, climbing, surfing, canyoneering, and pretty much anything in the outdoors. Um, my name is Andrea Slazarski. I guess I would say I'm a drawer of nature, um, and that takes place in my sketchbooks, in different paintings, different works, different illustrations. Um, yeah, and so whatever kind of inspires me in the outdoors, um, that's what I like to draw. And my name is Noelle Ferris, and I kind of recently had the old uh, career change identity crisis thing so calling myself an artist is pretty new for me within the last year um, I'm a trained environmental scientist biochemist so now I paint full-time um, pretty much entirely semi-abstract landscapes um, but I, I still definitely hold on to the environmental scientist title too because a lot of my work is inspired by um, some of my research training there and just my analytical mind I guess um, so yeah, that's kind of a, a fun, new, exciting title for myself to call myself a, a mixed media uh, landscape painter. There you go. Awesome. Noel, uh, maybe we can start with you. Well, do you want to just practice and say, Sure. my name's Noel, I'm an artist, a few times to get, get <laughs> My name's Noel. <laughs> Hi, my name's Noel, I'm an artist. <laughs> I Thank actually, you. the first time I told somebody I was a writer, it was at a trade show, and I felt like I was faking it, and yeah. they just said, oh, that's cool, and I said, whew, all right, okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a, a, a fun title, but yeah, you know, still trying to figure out what that means, I guess, to myself. I'm kind of interested in all three of you um, deciding. I feel like it's a difficult thing to decide to do something that's art or photography, and um, how to figure out how to do it full time. So I was wondering if we could all maybe start with you, the yeah. origin story of how you did decide to do that and yeah, go for it. And how well, long ago it was. Sure, sure, sure. Happy to talk about that. Um, I think your statement that you do anything you can to you know, keep from having a real job is something that resonates with me a little bit. I was working in um, San Francisco in environmental tech. I think my, my specialty as an, an environmental scientist has been in um, resource cycling within agricultural systems. So had some really interesting jobs after grad school looking at how kind of agricultural systems assemble themselves and how humans uh, manage them in terms of you know, resource scarcity and efficiencies. And was uh, working, I don't know, 70 hours a week at a San Francisco startup company after a few years just kind of wanting to pull my hair out, having to answer to someone else in terms of my schedule. So about a year ago, I, this is a little more than a year ago now, um, left that job with the idea that I would just take two months off before kind of looking for another thing in that space and was painting every day. I've, I've painted for years, but never really did it, you know, as more than a hobby. And, you know, I just, that, that thing they say, which is, you know, try and do that thing in life, which, you know, keeps you up all night. Um, that's always been painting for me. And after being able to do that full time for a couple of months after quitting my job, I just realized, you know what, this is, they were right, this is what keeps me up at night, totally. Um, so I've managed to find a way to do that full time, um, and I'm happy to dig into that a little more, but it's been a really easy transition for me in that respect. Um, it just feels really natural. Um, you know, working 70 hours a week as an artist is so much more refreshing than working 70 hours a week as an employee for someone else. So that's been really fun. Did you, was there some sort of like moment where you said oh, I love you know like I love painting but I have to sell this like yeah. how does that how does this equate <laughs> to money was that yeah. a thing yeah um I've been listening to this really great 
uh, art marketing podcasts and you know all these creatives out there that have no idea how to run a business. This is kind of really good for them. Um, and one of the first things that I think they, they talk about in this podcast is as an artist or any kind of a creative, you have to do the does my art suck test really early on, which is, you know, does someone other than my mom or my boyfriend actually want to pay money for my work? Um, <laughs> I did that. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been doing that for, for years, just subconsciously. You know, I'd, I'd been commissioned to do paintings, I think, for a couple years before going full time and then you know, launched my website really early on and started getting really active on Instagram um, right after quitting my job and painting a lot. And just getting people, I think, really regularly asking how they could buy my work. So I think the Does My Art Suck test was something I did early on enough to figure out, okay, I, I think if I continue to push on this and grow and figure out how to sell and market efficiently, um, I, can, I can make money doing this. So yeah, it was, it was a slow burn, but I, I think I got positive results on that test, which helped. Yeah. Wise. So you're painting a little bit before you quit your job, like yeah. kind of on, the, was it therapeutic? Cause you were like, yeah, totally. Okay. Um, and maybe you guys can relate to this too, but there's always been that fear that, you know, moving towards painting full time, um, from it being a hobby where I would kind of go there to escape. I was nervous about, you know, all of a sudden that becoming work and the allure and, and charm and escapism of that going away. But, um, luckily that hasn't been the case. So, um, I've just continued to find that it just feeds my creative fire instead of like quenching it. Um, so that's been really fun. Okay. Andrea, do you want to talk and about? So in career, well, I guess I've been always trying to make a career out of art. Uh, my daytime job is really cool. I'm a painting teacher in a high school. So I'm always drawing, I'm always painting. Um, what that looks like for my future, I am following. I really enjoy teaching and I think uh, to say that I want to like quit teaching and be full-time artist, I doesn't give enough credit to my teaching practice, which has been pretty monumental in my growth as an artist and in my own technical skill and just my own thoughts and growing. So without being a teacher, I don't think I would be the artist I am today. And without being the artist I am today, I don't think I would be as influential as a teacher. So they go hand in hand. Figuring out how those work together is really fun. And then at the end of the day, like, your art teacher in high school is pretty cool. And so I found a pretty cool day job. Um, everyone has a story about their art teacher or everyone knows something weird that their art teacher did. And being able to use that platform while I grow my own artist voice, I think is very helpful for me personally as an artist and also for you know what is my voice as an artist? How am I gonna teach? How am I going to inspire? Yeah, oh, I was man. gonna ask that. Yeah, what are they talking Every about? Every Friday when we leave class or when the class ends, I go, "All right, guys, have a good weekend, and remember, you're only in trouble if you get caught." <laughs> and like the first time I say it, like only 10% of kids are like, "That's what?" And then everyone's like, "Oh, you're so weird." And then like the kids who oh, get it, man. I'm like, "Yeah, don't get caught." <laughs> yeah. Do the two worlds ever sort of uh, bleed into each other for you? Do you? Are you ever talking to your students about your personal work? Like, are you saying, oh, this is the piece I'm working on right now. Do you uh, guys think it sucks? <laughs> if you they do, would be the first you're getting a D. They would be to tell you. They would, to me, um, sorry to cut you off, but um, I was just thinking about when I was sitting here on Monday, I look up and there were three students of mine that are currently in art school right now we're coming around the corner. And they're not in the outdoor industry. They're, they're Metro Denver kids. And to help bridge that gap to where art brought them in, and they got to sit in on a session about like wellness in the outdoors, like that's important. And they wouldn't have come down here without that sort of invitation through the art. Yeah, so yeah it, they cross over often. Okay, and you don't you don't see them at the bar or anything usually like. Thank goodness. No, I don't really go out that that much. But um, the worst thing is when you're in like the grocery store and you hear like Miss Slew, and you're like, no, <laughs> just want to wear my pajamas. I, I was with a buddy who teaches math in Fort Collins one time, and we ran into one of his students, and I kind of he was like really excited to see her, and she was not, and I'm like, I don't think she actually likes you, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> whatever, yeah. So th that whole statement about those who can't do teach, you're like, yeah, bullshit. I'm doing it and I'm Total teaching Total bullshit. It. Yeah, okay, good. 
Well, and kids can see that, right? So when you're walking the walk, it's a lot easier to get your students to buy into it. And I like to share that with them. I like to share them the, the ups and the downs of being an artist. Um, encourage them themselves to pursue. Um, I have kids make their own Instagram accounts for art, and I have them reach out to artists. And so me being an artist professionally, professional artist, um, I think really opens the door to a lot of younger students who are learning because they see that they can ask me, they can learn from me, and they can aspire or you know learn different lessons that I share. And they know that they're real because I'm being authentic with them. Right. Do you uh, express to them that it might be a thing that they need a day job too for a while, or you yeah. just like, or do you um, want to make literally hundreds of dollars a year selling? You, you know, I this is a is this a big kind of conversation um, with my students and being real and practical. And one of the things that I reflected on a lot about my own education as an artist was I was told, okay, well you can be an art teacher because that's a solid job or you're gonna be broke and poor and live in your parents' basement. And, and that has shifted in the last decade because there are so many creative careers and there's so many ways that you can take a creative direction. That doesn't mean you're a painter in your garage. I am a painter in my garage um, often, but um, you know, I wish I would have had someone be like, you can get creative with your passions and kind of fuse them and follow that direction a little bit more. And so to be that teacher and to be able to you know, say, this creative life is hard, but this creative life, if you work hard and you find what really makes your passion tick, you can follow that. And I have a lot of students who will go into different careers and talk about the art classes they took in college and how that helped them in their studies or helped them in just their learning. So I talk about a lot of like creativity and art more as a lifestyle and help those students who want to pursue them as careers. But for the majority of my students, I think that it's important to you know, think creatively and to know that they're artists and that they can solve problems themselves and it doesn't mean you have to be you know, a professional artist. You can just be an artist in your everyday life. And I tell kids, if you are decorating your house someday and you remember that complimentary colors look nice together, I'll be happy. <laughs> when they're kooky Miss Slew, they're gonna be like, oh, she knows. That, that actually can make the world a lot better place more than a lot of things, yeah. Okay, Kat, you've had a long time to think about this. Do you wanna? <laughs> Almost too long. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. I think there's no shame in the part-time game. No. And um, I've been shooting um, in the outdoor industry for 10 years now, but only the last two years full-time. So I definitely worked for a long time, part-time, had a full-time job on the side. And you know, when people ask me, like, how do you make it work? I'm like, well, I had a full-time job for a very long time. And um, there was like an intersection where I was taking time off of my full-time job to go do my part-time job. And then I kind of knew, um, like Noelle, that like maybe I could make this thing work full time. So um, yeah, yeah, you have to, to work for a long time to make sure not only your mom and your boyfriend want to buy <laughs> your work. Um, and and uh, I, I totally agree, there's no shame in, in working for as long as you can because it's your passion. You're probably doing it on the side anyway. Um, so go for it. If you love what you do, you'll be doing it whether you're getting paid or not. I think, and then getting paid as a bonus, and then it builds from there. <laughs> um, do you want to talk about how you decided to go full time with it? Like what that moment was like? Was it like? Uh, it was a scary moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what are you doing for work at that time? And then I was kind of like an urban planner in San Diego, and um, yeah, the moment I decided to go full time, I was just kind of over my job, sort of like Noel and. I wasn't working nearly as much as she was. It was actually like a great job. I loved my boss. Uh, I only worked like 35 hours a week. I sort of made my own schedule. I rode my bike to work. And I found that like if I was trying to figure out like still how to do this thing full time while I had this nice like job that I liked and I enjoyed the people that I work with, then maybe it's a thing that I should go for and like I said it was slowly building but it was definitely scary taking the leap and you know the first month when you're like either sitting by yourself or like trying to f just trying to figure out the first 
steps of like, what do I do? Like, where do I start? You've already, I assume, like built, like I had built something. I had a website. I had a portfolio. Um, so I had some things, but then, you know, most of the work that I had was people coming to me. Um, and I was just keeping up with the work that I was getting from pe people coming to me. So when I had to learn how to pitch and to put myself out there, that's a really steep learning curve. You realize, like, no, I, I, I have to work more than I did at my full-time job <laughs> to make this passion a full-time job. To avoid a full-time job. To avoid job. a full-time like, job. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You end up working a full-time job to avoid a full-time job. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's uh, let's go back this way again. Um, I'd like each of you guys to talk about sort of an important place in the outdoors that's either influential or you go back to or has informed your could be an experience that you had that kind of was like, oh, this is a thing. I could go do this. Do you have one of those? First. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Let's go with you first. Yeah. I. I People ask me uh, this, so the pr about previous two years before this, I uh, lived on the road creating full time, um, which is when I started launching, or when I launched my photography business. Um, and because I was on this like long road trip and I kept going back to San Diego to do work and stuff like that, but I was sort of was like figurating around the West basically. What, what's the vehicle you're in this <laughs> time? <laughs> 2002 Chevy Suburban. Oh, that's legit. It's a big yeah, guy. I it's a good <laughs> one. I w we w <laughs> that's my husband over there. We wanted a we wanted a four by four vehicle that um, yeah that was capable and could get us to places and and um, also that what did not cr cost a lot of money. <laughs> so um, we ended up choosing that. But yeah, so everyone always asks me in in the two years of your travel, w what's your favorite place? That's a standard question. I've been asked that question a lot of times. And I keep going back to three places. And one um, is just, I think, I, I learned to love. I mean, I was kind of in awe of it the first time that I rolled into like the desert southwest and the Red Rock. Uh, and the alien landscape there is just one of my favorite places on the face of the planet. And um, I came to know and love Baja, California. Um, and the empty surf breaks there also. We spent a month um, in 2016. Uh, doing the whole peninsula, and that was an amazing place. And I love, I speak Spanish, I love the people and the culture. And, um, and then Alaska is the third place, which I haven't actually been back to since 2009, and I'm dying to go back, but I got to see the aurora for the first time. And just, yeah, you can totally, <laughs> totally come. But see the, the grandness of the landscape. So each of those landscapes is grand in a completely different way. And, um, and I find myself inspired in a completely different way to create and to take photos. Very diverse. Okay, you guys can talk about three places if you want to. <laughs> you, I, I'm like one is good, but if you anywhere want to do up that to there three is fine. <laughs> anywhere that there are trees and untouched powder is probably my happiest spot to start. And you're not going to tell us your secret um, backcountry well, stash. I just, yeah. Anywhere. Like, you can find that in a lot of places. I just will yeah. always find it. Um, uh, similar with Kat, I was thinking, um, I moved to Colorado from Illinois. Very different landscapes. Um, but I, my sister, whenever she comes out, she always loves to joke about every time we go into the mountains, I'm the one who's like, did you see that? You see them? You s check it out. And she's like, I see them. And she's like, you've lived here forever. And she's like, you're still acting like you just moved here today and it's the first time you ever saw mountains. Um, and I felt very similarly about the desert. And I think I will make a pilgrimage to Utah every year, as many as I can. I did not know that that was a landscape that really existed. No one really tells you to go see the desert. Like it's, you, you know, and I remember going there the like first fall that I moved to Colorado and just being like, where? am I. So just, I don't know, all the landscapes. I just love the lines. I love what they create. I love discovering new places. I'm super jacked about tomorrow morning because I'm going to Montana for the first time. Um, but in terms of favorite place, I guess I don't really have one because I'm still looking for them. Way to avoid the question Colorado. over like three minutes. Yeah, I know, I know, I'm really good at it. Where's your spot in the desert? Like, what is what's a what's one piece of desert architecture? 
Indian Creek, going camping there. I'm okay. not even a climber. I still think it's cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. just a fun spot to camp, and it just feels really massive. And I like the warmth. Okay. Yeah, there you go. All right. Noel. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot recently about why I think deserts are such a fun muse right now, just in the creative space, be it photographers or artists. Um, and I think everyone has their own answer. Part, part of it is just that the, the color palettes are beautiful. But um, one reason why I'm drawn to deserts, because I, I would say I put a lot of deserts in my own work, are just how incredible just the regeneration of life is in deserts. I love symbolically that deserts tend to be full of very resilient life forms that can you know, withstand months of drought. And then all of a sudden in spring, um, life seems to just explode out of anywhere. So I think just at this point in you know, our own existence as humans, where we have a lot of landscapes that are you know, threatened and our own kind of sustainability in our landscapes threatened as well. Um, I think the symbolism of really resilient, efficient creatures that deserts tend to represent, I, I find really fascinating for sure. Um, so that's one, but I, I would say that probably the root of my just curiosity about the natural world that's kind of happened in the last um, 10 years that really feeds my art has just come from spending a lot of time on farms as an agricultural science person. I'm really fascinated with how life forms, again, tend to organize themselves. Um, a lot of my paintings do explore you know, the confluence of man and nature. Um, I, agriculture was always where I chose to focus um, in science because that was really interesting to me. Um, we absolutely depend on natural resources so intimately you know, when you look at agriculture. Um, and there's just a really interesting relationship there. So I love thinking back to times that I spent on research farms in South Africa where you actually get, it's, it's a little different from the Midwest, which is beautiful in its own way, but you actually get beautiful mountainscapes um, kind of right up against these highly organized, like um, I guess they, 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 they go in terms of hectares, they're not acres, but you know, many hectare farms of corn, soy, wheat fields um, right next to these like very organic, uh, mountainscapes uh, in places like South Africa and, and those landscapes are just really interesting to me and like I said you know I, I do tend to throw a lot of structured geometry and almost architectural features in with fluid landscapes in my own work and some of that's rooted in just that um, that just kind of op opposing aesthetic landscape that I have spent a lot of time with 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 agriculture right up against very wild nature um, yeah. Okay. Um, I was gonna, I kind of want to know, like, in, in your guys' experience, what has been a hard lesson to learn? Um, maybe we'll start with you, Noel. I'll go first after, so to give you guys a little start, time to think. Why don't you start us off? You have something um, in your mind. <laughs> just for an example that I've realized, um, I've, I've written a blog every single week for almost eight years, and I've realized that I've started to steal from myself, where... <laughs> I wrote a blog like three weeks ago and I was like going through a book manuscript that I had turned in going, holy shit, I wrote almost that exact same thing and I had no memory of it. It was the same amnesia, you know, and like um, that and you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and it won't take off. Um, but, but what's a hard lesson you've learned so far? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I think, I don't know if this is going to distill itself into one lesson that really struck me, but just one of the hardest things that I've found in being a working artist has been, um, I think Kat touched on this earlier, but you really have to be so much more than just an artist to be successful as an artist. So, you know, I, I think before I, I started on this path full time, I envisioned this life path where I, I, I think for 15 years when someone asked me what I really wanted to do, I was like, I want to throw overalls on and get coffee high and just paint all day. Um, and so I kind of pictured this world where I could just like seep in my creative weirdness all day and I like to stay up like all night sometimes. And um, I, th I think the, the lesson that I learned really quickly was that again, to be an artist that is able to sell work and sell through a diverse number of channels and you know, speak to a lot of different people about what the art means um, so that they'll eventually buy it or at least want to work with you is you have to absolutely like rip yourself. I have to anyways rip myself out of that space which is just like really off hours and a lack of structure and put my business business hat on for sure um so yeah on, on any given day i'm like 
on the computer, trying to be very structured with like marketing, sales, and communications, and all that stuff. And then I have to like totally rip myself back out of that and get into the really open, weird, creative space to be able to create. And so, I think the hard lesson there is just realizing, you know, you, you it can't be just one of those things. It has to be both. Um, and it's always been or it has been over the last year, an interesting challenge to figure out how to just organize my day and my week to make sure that I can be effective in both and spend time in both of those places. Yeah, like that, the romantic vision of an artist is like, no, it doesn't include email, you know, you're like, yeah. No, it doesn't. I like that part of it, but. Um, yeah. Or finding clients. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Andrea, do you, do you have a lesson? Uh, lessons. Um, I guess I was thinking, and I think all artists will go, this is just a lesson that's always happening, and it changes, is figuring out where the balance of process and meaning and self and, and what goes into the work and, and walking that line to where I am myself and I'm also in my work. And so I've... It, it's, it's taken a lot of reflection and a lot of process and being able to understand that you're in a process is super important because I will it fully admit when I was younger uh, in college I didn't dive into process and I thought that it wasn't important and my work did not have me in it and I could tell that and I kept thinking it was technique or you know it was the skill set wow. and it wasn't until you know I learned from other artists and I listened and I reflected on myself that I was able to really look inward and discover that I need to also indulge in my process in order to make great art. And process means I need to go hike sometimes and being able to say when I need to leave the studio or when I need to take a step back or maybe I need to change my medium or I need to go talk to a friend or I need to go for like a run and knock my crap out. Um, and just really understand, and then, and being okay with that that's gonna change and that's gonna look different every day, every year, and just kind of learn to go with it instead of fight it. Have you ever had to turn around on a run because you had like the epiphany? Or you, did you just like tough it out and like, <laughs> I'm just gonna remember that? Um, a more miles. <laughs> Sketchbooks help. I always have a sketchbook. I have two While of them. While you're running? Right. Not, I don't really run. I go for a hike. Running oh, is a little crazy. Okay. In the mountains. <laughs> it's nice out there. I'm going to go for a walk. Um, I always have a sketchbook. Um, I'll do a lot of voice notes when I'm my, by myself, which is helpful, because um, a lot of them happen in the car, actually. Like record in, into a phone? Yeah, into your phone. in my yep. phone. Because um, when I'm outside, you know, it is nice to get like those big ideas, but I really just try... My outdoor time is my time to connect with myself. And so I like being able to, to go feed that and then make some voice memos or reflect when I get home later. Do you think they sound as smart? At, you know, like when you, if you listen to them, like the next day, you're like, oh, huh. I have that happen a lot. Like, oh, All the time. That was genius yesterday. What happened? You know? Or you like stop and then you like read like half of the thought, thought and you're like, what was going on? Like, what is that word? I don't even know what was that. Where are you at? Autocorrect? Like, you always, is, you always forget to add the context when you're doing the voice memo, right? Which like actually adds the meaning to what that weird snippet of your brain was. Yeah. Like, what happened? I like, yeah. Where was I in my head? Yeah. Kat, do you have a do you have a hard lesson? Yeah. So. Um, I occasionally teach adventure photography workshops, and I was teaching one a couple weeks ago, and um, the students there ask really good questions that like, I have to think about to answer, and they make me think about things that maybe I didn't think about before. And uh, someone came up to me after the one I caught, taught a couple weeks ago and said, how do you deal with the failure, <laughs> like the constant failure? And it is constant, and um, you're constantly getting rejected, and you have projects that never take off, and maybe four at a time that don't take off, and you sort of always have your hand in like five different things to make it work, and yeah, it's, it, it does get to you sometimes. You're not made of steel. Uh, you get better at it over time, and I think that, um, you know, she was struggling with that in the moment, and um, I've struggled with that my entire career of 
of you know rejection and just not getting an email back and I've learned to sort of poke and just kind of keep emailing or call or pick up a phone and call because people can't you know if you they hear your voice on the phone they're more <laughs> likely to talk to you <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah you, you definitely have to to grow a thicker skin which I don't think I had a very thick one to begin with and so that was definitely a learned thing for me to um, learn to deal with the rejection and the failure. I used to I used to get rejection letters when I was starting out as a writer and I was going through a file like two years ago when we were moving and I was like holy shit I found like 20 some rejection like, like I was saving them like I was all pissed <laughs> off I'm like I'm gonna show these people and you start going through like oh yeah the intern at Sierra magazine in 2004 I'm sure yeah I'm sure she's probably not there anymore but yeah look what I'm up to now do you have a file of, of uh, rejection emails now <laughs> no because I think you, I mean you guys probably would agree with this I think being ignored is the new rejection right yeah, it's just like totally. yeah you just don't get emailed back it, and you Cold. can email four or five times and still nothing yeah. yeah come on come on Kevin I think you'd really like this like I don't know what are you busy Kevin doesn't want that <laughs> okay fine yeah um, they told uh, one of my, I was on a book tour and the publisher told me, the publicist told me that when you do book signings uh, in a bookstore, that 90% of bookstore audiences, like the people in them believe that they might be able to write a book someday too. So I would always start out by congratulating the audience on their eventual book, you know, like, guys, this is going to be great. <laughs> You're not going to sell very many, but you know. Um, so I'm kind of like putting this into your perspective, your guys' perspective, what is a piece of advice you would give to someone who is interested in doing what you do or, and or what is advice you would give to yourself when you were first starting out that you didn't know that like younger me um, and whoever wants to go first? Um, I'll just, I think, go back to something I said before and I don't mean this to be harsh at all and I am always redoing this with myself, but um, having have gone to a lot of shows recently where I'm selling art, like art festival type things, and I just see a lot of creatives trying to peddle their work, including myself. Um, when you're first starting out, I think before spending a bunch of time and energy, at least on like the body of work that you're working on at that moment, because you can always grow as an artist, but you've, you've got to do the does my art suck test if you want to sell it. Um, and sometimes it's just, is my art unique enough to stand apart from, you know, whether you're a landscape photographer, which I know there's a ton of competition in that space. As a landscape artist, that's, that's kind of the same thing. But um, I just have, yeah, seen a lot of folks and some of the stuff I work on myself too, spending a lot of time like really, you know, creating this, this product um, without really testing it first. And I think that's a lesson I learned certainly working in you know, tech, which is fast paced startup world where they're like product test the crap out of everything, you know, find the right market before you really spend a lot of time and energy. Um, so I'd say get like an, an MVP, a, a minimum viable product out there into the world really soon and see if there's a market for it. And you kind of iterate on that quickly before building a huge website around it, right? Or, you know, I spend a bunch of money upfront on inventory because I sell a lot of stuff retail. Um, You've always got to test that stuff out before investing much time and money into producing a lot of it. And if the result is nobody wants my stuff, then maybe rethink what it is you're doing. And if it's, you know, some people like my stuff, but it's not standing out enough, maybe it's just iterating to get to a point where your work is standing apart from the crowd a little bit more. Is that is it like the testing? Are you saying like, what does that look like? Is it more like kind of like social media where you're like, yeah, hey, I mean, it can be there. as easy as that. Totally. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a difference between someone hitting like on a photo on Instagram and then, you know, getting a direct message that says, I you know, how much, that. how much do I buy yeah. this for? So maybe just a really practical thing, um, which I started doing on early or early on, I, you know, last year before I, you know, really quit my job was just saying in the caption, you know, this is for sale, DM me to inquire. Um, and actually getting people, whether I was going to sell it or not, seeing if people actually responded in that way. So that's a really easy one to do. Um, sometimes, I don't know, you know, the, the, the quick and dirty one for the musician is just like getting out and whatever that term is for uh, playing on the street corner. B but busking. Do, busking, yeah. right? Do people actually stop and listen to your music? Um, there are pretty easy, cheap ways to just see if the world is wanting what it is that you make. 
Besides calling your mom. Like, mom, yeah. what do you mom think? doesn't count. That's yeah. like rule one of the Does My Heart Suck yeah. test. <laughs> Actually, my mom was the number one person who was always like, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> A lot of the more wow. abstract stuff. So she was out from the beginning. I love you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe art's not for you, mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, had a, I had a graph of audience size, and it's like, your mom is the end, and the other end is like Justin Bieber fans. Like, you want to be somewhere in the middle. Like, yeah. Okay. I remember putting like bluish shadows on some, you know, mountainscapes, which is, you know, how you do a lot of shadow colors on blue. And my mom would be like, but why is it blue? <laughs> <laughs> it's just the color of shadow sometimes, mom. Because it's your <laughs> Christmas present, mom. That's yeah. what you're getting. So, you know, fi find the right audience, too, right? Yeah. But yeah. Anyways. Andrea? Um, I guess it, it kind of uh, stirs from what I said earlier, but really diving into your process and figuring out what it means for you to create. Um, you're not going to have authenticity in your work if it's not coming from you personally. And that is a really long conversation that you need to have with people that you trust or people that yourself and just listening and learning from people around. I'm still pretty young, pretty new to this game. So I have a lot to listen. and. Um, I wish I would have told myself that even earlier in my life, I think would have been helpful. And I think that's really good. Do you have somebody who's like gives you tough love about, about stuff? Like you can turn to it and they're like, yeah, nah, that looks too much like somebody else's or? Not exactly uh, specifically tough love, but I think when you're trying too hard on something and it's not working, it's, her turning back inward and saying, why isn't this working for me? Am I forcing something? Am I trying something that's not natural? And reflection, keeping a sketchbook, um, going on experiences, that is all part of my creative process. And I think can just be said to everyone kind of looking at, you know, what their goals are and where they want to and how they want to get to them. Okay. Kat? Yeah, um, I feel like I'm going to sound very practical when I say this, but... <laughs> Start a savings account. I could tell my younger <laughs> self, um, I would say you need to have a baseline of, like, everyone who is doing this professionally has a baseline of good work, like great work, right? So your work has to be great. Then once you get beyond that, you really need to be business-minded, and you have to, like they both said, step outside of the artistic process and all of that stuff and really focus on, like, what can I do with this now? Um, and I feel like, for me, like, I knew that going in, but it was also kind of a hard slap in the face, like, right away. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I would tell myself, you know, think about those things. When people tell you you need to network, you do actually need to network. Like, you need to get to know people who might potentially buy your work, um, who you can collaborate with, which I have uh, found to be, like, some of the most useful things I've done are, are artist collaborations like this. Like this turned into something that I had no idea what it was going to be when Andrea called me and was like, well, do you want to do this thing? I'm like, I don't really understand what you're saying. I got a crazy I idea. <laughs> and so cool, let's do it. And it just turned out amazing. And I got to meet Noelle and I knew Andrea before, but um, yeah, so uh, doing collaborations and putting yourself out there, all of those things are so important. Um, to my process and to, you know, getting stuff in front of more eyes. I think that's good. I feel like most people think it's not a job. It's like, yeah, what well, can I just like smoke some weed and like sculpt or something? Like, <laughs> no, nah, dude, you gotta like, there's email. Yeah, you have to, yeah, no, it's actually a job. Sorry. I feel like so many people, w when they're asking how like I do this, and I'm like, forget about the photos for a second. <laughs> like, here are five important things that you need to know um, that will help you make it. Like, yes, you need a baseline of great work, but you also need 15 other things. So you sort of have to be a Jack, a Jill of all trades. <laughs> Jane. Jane. <laughs> um, and, Kat, and to kind of, and to kind of back on what Kat was saying, we, we were talking a lot last night about just the relationships and, and growing those and making sure those are an important part of our lives and our creative process because this was a fun project that I got to do with some friends. And 
I admired these friends as artists, and that was what was cool to work with them. So the relationship building and, and being able to, you know, networking sounds so professional, but at the end of the day, you're, you're building really cool friendships and you're building really cool connections with people that are different than you, that um, have other skill sets that you can learn from or, you know, work together. So I think that's a big thing. I look at everyone as an opportunity to promote my work. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how can you help me? <laughs> Otherwise, we're not, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Isn't, isn't that the basis of OI? That's, that's everything, yeah. And if I, I'm trying to make this judgment within four seconds, then I just move on. If, <laughs> even if they're in the middle of a sentence, I just walk away. <laughs> Do you guys want to talk about um, this piece right here? First, I'd like, kind of explain it, how it came about. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like what, what it actually is, nuts and bolts. If you guys haven't seen, there's this one, and then there's one around the corner also. I think we should have Andrea start, because Andrea came up or came with the, uh, up with the original sketches and I think uh, original concept, so go for it. I feel like there was like a day of crazy in my studio for a hot minute. Uh, Chuck yeah, came to me with the idea of trade school and after going in January, I was really excited to be a part. Um, I really admired the artists that were at the last trade show and felt very humbled to have gotten the phone call. And like Chuck was saying earlier, before he could even like spit out water women in the West, I was like, I gotta call Kat. I got to call Noel. And it was, it, was, it was turning. And that was what I was saying about kind of the relationship part is I really turned towards my friendship with these two and the friendships I was growing with Harmonic and Public Works and something independent and just started going, how can we work together? What are the parts that I admire of these artists? And I started just kind of sketching. Um, I sent my boyfriend like 20 files to print at work. I don't have a printer. <laughs> I was like, hey, can you print these off and bring them over? Uh, he came home from work, and I was like, hi, bye, and took all my printings and went to my studio and just started cutting them all up and assembling them all together. Uh, and what just first instantly was the colors in Kat's photograph really popped out. Before we even started going, she sent me a few sample photos, and they were the color spread that Something Independent gave me as the theme. And I was like, wow, Kat, <laughs> So did you, did you pick out this photo then for this one? Uh, or Noelle was it? and I did. Okay. Uh, Kat, you know, we told her the themes and she went through her her awesome files and put a Google yeah, Doc together. I think I sent about 30 pictures that had something to do with water women in the West and um, they ended up choosing the two images that are here. Is this one actually you in the photo? That That's me, a self-board, yeah. so. <laughs> that is me, yeah. The only yeah. other person with me was my husband, so if I wanted so a is it actually woman, his photo? woman in the photo. <laughs> was this not a timer shot? So is it his photo? Yeah, on a timer. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, yes. you know, just kind of played around with the ideas. I, um, I use a lot of words in my work and really took this as an opportunity to highlight women words. Um, so the words above the top, which is cool coming to the artist talk, um, the quotes that you find on this piece in the back are not mine. This is actually Rachel Carson's quote. Um, pulling that out and when I go and, and start diving into ideas or landscapes is I really like to look at what's deeper in them. What, what are, what's the human connection? What's the research? How, like what, why do we need to know about this landscape? And in researching, I came across her as just a bomb. Yeah, a badass woman environmentalist that I had no idea about, and that's dumb. So I'm going to be her voice, and I'm going to put her words out there for people. And um, on the other side was Paula Gunn Allen. Uh, I wanted to make sure I got that right. And specifically for the Red Rocks um, on the other image, I wanted to find a Native woman's voice and bring that into the conversation. So being able to to research and learn myself into these works and use my art practice to share that research and kind of cool ideas and, and leave people with, a, hey, I'm gonna go Google Rachel Carson, um, is what I wanna bring meaning-wise to my work. And then, yeah, then Noelle, I, you know, I, I really just called these two and couldn't quite explain what it was at the moment, but I was so happy that they were just like, I got a weird idea. <laughs> It's like, you want to do it? And then Noelle, c it, thankfully, um, you know, Noelle was able to come in and add her touches, and it was just, it was just really fun, the whole process. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah, this wasn't, 
that different from my typical creative process anyways, because I, I usually start off with trying to capture some realistic elements of a landscape anyways, and luckily, thankfully, um, Kat kind of took, took care of that for us. So um, yeah, we selected these, these photos. Andrea basically said, hey, throw some of your, your geometry that kind of contrasts with the landscape on there, do whatever you want. Um, and that's usually, again, a, a, a midpoint of my work anyways. So what I did with both of these and what I typically do is I'll look at the landscape that I'm you know, trying to really highlight in the picture and do a little research and contemplation about what makes that part of the world or these landscape features um, precious and somewhat endangered, if that's even applicable. And then I will think to myself about what is the human element um, on these landscapes that's kind of worth highlighting in some piece of artwork. So for this one in particular, um, you know, the landscape features that are, are pretty obvious here are the existence of you know, some forests and then we have some, some river running through it. So when I thought about the West and some of the challenges that we have with running waters in the West, um, what immediately comes to mind for me um, is the damming of a lot of just the, the running surface waters that we have. Um, so although it's a little bit abstract, um, these kind of, so the, you know, the colorful structures with the trees in it, if you can't even tell what those are, um, those are a little reflective of tree houses, but the, the tree houses to me were symbolic of just building structure onto water um, to manipulate the flow of water a little bit, um, which is, you know, something we've actually gotten better at over the last couple decades is really thinking more about how the way we manipulate the flow of water influences the landscapes downstream and influences salmon and other life forces, but you know, sometimes that's as deep as I'll get, is what, what is kind of the human influence on this landscape um, that is really typical for these areas. So, you know, the, the damming of waterways, and then the symbolism of the trees there um, is a little symbolic of, you know, the other thing that pops up to me, which is trees, and, you know, a lot of the challenges we've had with deforestation and just unsustainable forest management um, in the West, particularly, you know, all up and down California, where I'm from, um, which has a big influence on, you know, fire risk and whatnot. So I'll often put trees into house-like structures to symbolize the fact that we tend to cut down a lot of trees to do things like build houses and other residential or commercial features like that. So a lot of symbolism there, but they're also kind of just fun structures to get some colors to pop out there too. Um, and a little bit of this, you know, um, Public Works printed the photo with some digital files on top of it and some of the kind of house structures were um, just pulled from paintings that I had made. None of it was graphic design. Um, and then a lot of it I actually just painted back over and redrew some of these in here. Um, so that's kind of fun. And then on the other side, just really quickly, what came to mind with me with, with desert landscapes, trying to think about water there, is just how do we store and move water around in really arid landscapes. And two structures that came to mind for me there are you know, water storage systems like water towers and also aqueducts. So there's a lot of just weird stark geometry on that desert landscape, which is a little symbolic of you know, building these really high structures to hold water, which you see those a lot in um, actually you know, all over the country. Um, and then aqueduct structures, which just do tend to scape through otherwise unassuming landscapes. So that's kind of the symbolism there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty easy images to work with when it comes to trying to figure out how to incorporate some, some other artistic elements to just draw out what's special and precious about those, those landscapes. That's the fun part. It's kind of once we saw the images, like once we find, found the two, it was just like break and we were just ex like went after them. The, land, the, the photographs like really helped. Like, like it was just all like a really fun way that we were able to share what we do in our work and also, you know, mesh them all together. Yeah, I think the collaboration aspect was uh, really cool. Like I said, I had no idea how it was going to turn out when Andrea called me and um, and then when I came here and saw them, I was like, oh, this is way cooler than I thought it was going to be. They had sent like snippets and pictures and stuff. And it's actually printed, is it, it's printed on wood, right? Um, so that's cool because you can see some of the grain through that as well. Andrew, so do you want to talk Props to Public about Works for just uh, hooking us up with all of that stuff. Yeah. Yes, big thank you. And I believe if you bought a raffle ticket on your way in, we'll do that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's not, I don't know. No, but these will be going to Westfax Brewery for about a month, one to two months um, out in Lakewood while we, you know, figure out how to best, I think, make use of these pieces um, as 
um, some way to raise some money for an outdoor organization around here. So more, more to come on that, but they'll yeah. be at Westfax for one or two months. Okay. Do we have time for questions from the audience? Does anybody have anything you want to ask? The first one's always the toughest. Or we can do none and wrap up. Is that good? Okay. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks well, for coming, thank you everybody. So much. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. Kat, Welcome. Andrea, Noel, really so much. And Brendan, thanks for uh, taking time to guide the conversation here. Um, and thanks for listening, tuning in. You can uh, check this out later for a little uh, artistic therapy and, and uh, uh, inspiration on the Facebook page. You can dig it up. It's something independent. Um, and we've got one more day of a couple talks. Um, actually, in the morning tomorrow at 8.30, uh, there is a workshop breakfast, the Adventure Impact Working Group. And so uh, Scott McGuire and from Stoke Broker and uh, uh, Ryan from First Ascents, I think, have been kind of leading the charge on this to gather a lot of the not-for-profit from the outdoor industry who are in town to just everyone's sort of working on their own stuff and can sometimes be a little bit siloed. So tomorrow's a chance at 8.30 in the morning to kind of get together and see what everybody's working on um, in, the, in the nonprofit world. So swing by for that. And then at 11, um, actually it'd be really interesting. Uh, this morning, uh, the, we mentioned this earlier, but uh, Colorado is one of eight states that has an Office of Outdoor Recreation Industry within kind of the governor's office or state economic development office. Uh, as an industry and as a coalition, these eight states actually have been working for the past year on establishing, establishing a set of accords that will sort of guide their collaboration um, as they develop policies at the national level uh, that will uh, hopefully elevate, advance the outdoor industries and, and sort of those industries that surround it. And I think you'll see sort of a, a lot more on that. I think you'll see particular impacts on communities where there's transitioning economies, like on the West Slope here, where there's kind of ups and downs of, of the extractive industries and you're seeing uh, river parks and outdoor recreation really uh, sort of being a boon to local economies and stuff like that. But anyways, what, what they did was uh, they worked for the past year and they recognized that whether they're in Vermont, North Carolina, Washington, Oregon, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, or Colorado, that they may not always sort of come to the same place on uh, discussions around public lands, public access, different policies, energy, but they did set out a, a, a set of, of, of accords, the Confluence Accords, that they could always come back to. Um, so we're sitting down with four or five of the state directors tomorrow morning at 11 to hear about the process of that. And Jason Blevins, uh, who's been following that for a long time, is going to moderate the conversation. Um, and then our last one is that one uh, uh, interesting conversation with on women of the water. Uh, interview with Darcy Getcher, who is the first woman to kayak the length of the Amazon River from source to sea. So, yeah. So anyways, so, so that's good. Um, thanks for being here. Aloft, thanks for being host. And one more day at trade school tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.